All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is uh, episode 42 of the Growing Band Director podcast. Very excited to have Michelle Fernandez with us from Miami, Florida, right in uh, Hurricane Alley, sort of, if you if you will. Um, and we're going to be working on a, a podcast called The Emotionally In Tune Band Director. Um, Michelle, how are you today? How are you holding up? Oh, I'm, I'm fine. We uh, Luckily, we were... Uh, very much not in the storm's path. I mean, we got some heavy rain um, that was pretty cool to look at through panoramic windows, but that's about it. I mean, mostly our concerns were for our friends that were living north of us. They definitely got hit much harder. Mm -hmm. So luckily we're getting all kinds of messages that everybody's okay. And um, they've just got a big mess to clean up. So our biggest mess was having to clean up paw prints from three muddy dogs because they had to, you know, stay inside all day because of the rain. That's well, pretty much all of our cleanup. Well, while prayer is going down that way, hopefully everybody is continuing to be safe as we go through this. You've been in Miami a long time, right? Um, can mm -hmm. you can you tell us yes. a little bit about your background as a teacher and what you do? Yeah, well, um, well, first of all, I just retired about a year ago after 30 years of uh, teaching in the public school system. Uh, down in South Florida. And I was originally from New York. I was born in New York and came down to Miami when I was eight years old and just enrolled in the public schools here in the same area. My mom's been living in the same house since I was eight years old. And um, basically I went through the public school system and graduated uh, in 1985. And I wanted to be a, a a criminal trial lawyer and I went to University of Florida majored in music education to keep my oboe scholarship but I took some criminology classes also on the side with the intent to graduate with my undergrad and then uh, apply to law school and of course keep music on the side and then my senior year at UF which is definitely a twist of fate my senior year at UF I got a phone call while I was vacuuming my room. And interestingly enough, it was my high school band direct, uh, I'm sorry, my high school principal, Diego Garcia. And it was interesting because I hadn't heard his voice in four years. But, you know, musicians, we can identify, you know, people's voices very easily. So anyway, the first thing out of my mouth was, Mr. Garcia, how'd you get my number? I didn't even say hi. <laughs> the vacuum was still running. And then he laughed and he said, well, you're the only Fernandez in the Gainesville phone book. <laughs> so um this was like further north it definitely wasn't miami mm -hmm. and basically he offered me the job because my old band director was leaving to become a principal elsewhere so they wanted somebody homegrown to take over and i remember instantly thinking this is my chance to not lose my music because i was starting to panic during my my last semester it's like the reality of having to leave a full immersion of, of being in all these musical groups was really hitting me. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was scary. And I saw that almost as a lifeline that came out of nowhere. And I decided, I remember I had the conversation with my parents because the first thing was, I thought you wanted to go to law school. And I was like, Hey, listen, what's the worst that'll happen? I'll try it for one year. If I don't like it, I'll have some money to help you pay for my law school. And 30 years just swallowed me up. I just got, you know, like the rest of us do. We all get sucked into this black hole of the whole dedication, the the thrill of, of teaching kids music, seeing them succeed, the whole family atmosphere in the band room. Uh, it, it, it was just all captivating. So that was it. I never looked back and I don't regret it at all. So that's how I became a band director. Well, that's that's great. Now that you're retired, what are you doing to engage band directors and students and all that? Well, it's it's interesting because one of the things that I was doing while I was teaching band and I, I did not major in composition was um, I used to write the uh, the stand tunes that the band would play and, and some of our field music. And I would write uh, arrangements for the, the after school uh, pop group that we had and our jazz band and i just got into that so little by little i guess as the years went by it's almost like one career started meshing into the other mm -hmm. so that when the first one morphed the other one was already kind of in play so i have been very fortunate where i am writing 
it now that I've retired and my stuff is getting published. And to be perfectly honest with you, it's uh, it's quite a thrill to wake up at two o'clock in the morning with a melody in your head and you have to you have to get up and run <laughs> to the computer and and put it down. Um, it used to be I just learned how to engrave a year ago. So for 30 years, I was literally writing everything by hand and copying yeah. all the parts yeah. by hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, it, it it's it's a it's an intoxicating thrill to be working on something and know that some kid on the other side of the country or the other side of the planet actually is going to be jumping up and down in their seat and forgetting whatever it is that troubled them a few hours earlier mm -hmm. because of something you wrote. And uh, you know we've all seen that that effect in our band rooms. We're playing a certain tune and we're standing in front of the kids and we're watching how fired up they are. Right. Right. And it, it's pretty intoxicating when you know that something that came out of your head is what's doing that, um, and not not from not from a, a sense of of uh, of achievement. Of course, that's always there, but more from a spiritual sense. Uh, it, it's to see kids feeling happiness because mm -hmm. of something that rolled out of your head is really cool. So you so, feel like you feel like you can touch and, a lot of students that way, right? You can touch students who are not near to you through, I, what, through that. Yeah, yeah. Basically, reach them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically reach them. And um, as a result, I've I've been writing some some pieces that um, you know that that have an actual spiritual meaning. And sometimes, and when I can, when the publisher lets me, I try to 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 write the spiritual significance of of what I was trying to convey as as a teaching tool as a learning lesson or just as something to raise awareness for example I have a piece that I'm I'm actually going to give away on my website um and I'm almost done with it but it's a grade two-ish bossa nova ballad that any child can play and it's called eso neblina which in Portuguese means that kids feel when other kids may say may say mean things about them so I, I actually have a paragraph that I worded um, and I put it on each student's part talking about, you know, whatever is being said about you. It's only fog. It's only temporary. It will lift. Keep being kind to others. Soon the real you will be obvious to everyone. Just just trying through music to do certain things to just kind of um, touch their souls, if possible. Mm -hmm. If we all do that just a little bit, you know, and we all do every day. So you said when we were talking earlier, you had a shift at one point in philosophy as you were a teacher, right? Um, yeah. I think we all oh, yeah. go through that. The more that life happens, both good and bad, right? That affects us as teacher, as teachers. And I think we realize the more we teach that we're responsible for the, the kids in more than just a musical way and understanding more of what happened. I, I remember when my first child was born, the first day I was back in the band room, how I looked at every single kid in the band differently, just because I had now had a small baby of my own. And I realized that there was a bigger thing happening here. Right. And that they were obviously children of, of somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it was weird because before I didn't Absolutely. feel, I, did, I didn't feel like I wasn't sympathetic before or understanding, but I hadn't, I didn't actually have any children of my own. So then when that actually happened, I felt like I was nicer maybe is the right word. Like I, I treated them like I would want to treat somebody to treat my own baby as they grow up. And, um, so that for me, that was a shift to, to treat them more like somebody's baby than just a student who's there and I'm trying to teach them music. So I'm really, I re really interested to hear about your, your philosophy, like what it was before and what happened and, and what it is now. Well, you 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 raised a great point, and I'm going to start with what you just said before I actually uh, share what it was that that shifted me to such a point. And the end result was such a dramatic um, psychological result that I'll share with you, and it, it's it's actually rather profound. Um, but going back to what you said, that you started treating them, and I'm sure you were still intense during rehearsals. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's part of the it's 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 part of of the of the craft because intensity becomes infectious. 
And when you're rehearsing and you're you're being demanding in a respectful way, obviously, you're being demanding and passionate about uh, what 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 the music is supposed to sound like. The kids feed off that, and they really do love that. Okay, no one wants someone on the podium going, "Okay, let's play this piece." Sounds good, guys. No, I mean people, you know, get a thrill out of the intense uh, part. Of, of that of that bonding between the conductor and the musicians. However, there's a way to do it where we are not causing injury or the biggest thing is damaging the self-esteem of an individual child. Because self-esteem is something that if it gets chipped away at little by little, and we have all gone through this in some setting or another, whether it's with an administrator or somebody that we thought was a friend or whatever, that, that that chipping away of walking on eggshells and is so and so going to yell at me again specifically and 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 I, part of the clinic that I do is I remind directors that when we hire marching band staff for example some of the marching band staff are young energetic you know energetic whippersnappers who march DCI mm -hmm. and excuse me if I'm offending anybody but I'm going to say it that bando commando kind of, of you know uh, mindset. And that's not why we're in band. Winning trophies are great, but I'm going to be honest with you. Whenever I go and I do a clinic, and, and again, I'm fortunate that the other part of my career now is I get hired quite a bit to do clinics and travel, and I've been around the country to work with different kids. When I walk into a band room and I see all the trophies, I see, first of all, plastic that collects dust. Okay? That's the least romantic part of it. The most romantic part of it is not that, wow, your band must be awesome. You must be a fantastic director. No. The awesome part of it is, is that when you see those trophies, you immediately think about kids that spent months sweating together to achieve something really beautiful mm -hmm. under your leadership, which is beautiful, under your loving leadership. I see in my mind kids hugging, kids throwing, you know, Gatorade coolers at each other because they they did something great the extrinsic suddenly becomes more intrinsic and i think that when your students graduate even the ones that you were tough on okay on whom you were tough excuse me even those students will take away not the memory of winning the trophy they're going to take away the the, the memory of how you made them feel and how you created an atmosphere where they were felt, uh, uh, where they felt welcome, where they felt safe, where they felt that they had friends. That's what they're going to remember. Mm -hmm. And I think that with recruitment, and I've, I've been seeing these comments on some of the forums, oh, you know, all these kids quit and this and that. I get it. It happens. Kids now are so uh, attached to this rectangle that they are used to the, you know, instant gratification. I want something, I can get it right now. Yep. Instead of having to sit up straight, holding an instrument for months. And, it, you know, so I think that if we can tap into giving them what they truly need and desire more than anything else, and that is friendship and acceptance. If they feel like they are in a family that won't let them down and they've got really close friends there, even if they have friends that quit band in the past or that are floating around the building uh, in some other sports team, that's, I think, that's the main thing that's going to keep them there is creating a family atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not that hard to do. And go now going back to what you, the, the comment that there or the question that you asked me about, what was it that, that helped me to kind of make a huge transition spiritually and mentally and, um, to be perfectly honest with you, it's 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 a difficult discussion. So I'm going to try to say it with a straight face, because sometimes sometimes I can talk about it without breaking down, and sometimes I can't. But um, into my tenth year teaching, and and again, before this happened to my family, I was very much in tune with my students. We had a very close relationship. Um, it was me and them. I didn't have much of a staff. There was one year where, uh, two years where I had an assistant director and then funding, I, I lost that. 
my first three years I was working with somebody but during the last part of it it was pretty much me and some peripheral staff came symphonic and jazz and all that it was it was me and the kids and it was a very low social economic area literally some of the instruments that were there were still there when I was a student 10 to 15 years prior mm -hmm. and they were held together with duct tape and many of the instruments were held together with my shoelaces that's the way it was we didn't have money for anything if we needed a pair of cymbals i had to go buy it myself i I'm, i was lucky if i had a five thousand dollar budget per year mm -hmm. to be honest and that included marching band i used to write my own drill until my last two years so we had a very close relationship already the kids and i were very tight because we had nothing but each other and i guess something went right because even without a single kid being able to afford private lessons they got picked to stuff like midwest iage we did the Montreal jazz festival those were significant achievements that i i gotta hand it to them not me i have to hand it to them because teenage kids you know a lot of them would rather be on the corner getting into mischief but yet if i would call a rehearsal at nine o'clock in the morning on a saturday they were there without question so there was a really deep loving loyalty there now what happened after that was such a huge transformation for me spiritually that i completely i did a 180 on the approach to how i would run the band and here it is into my 10th year of teaching um ninth year of teaching i i met my husband chad and um we we got married and i we we had a little boy right away and he was born with some difficulties and but nothing life-threatening he went to the into a hospital to have his uh feeding tube changed because he had some problems with his jaw so he had trouble uh, swallowing but he was getting therapy for that and during the process of changing out his feeding tube and i don't want to get into too much detail but anyway there was a perforation and um he ended up getting peritonitis he was in the hospital for uh, about 11 and a half months multiple surgeries to try to save him and we had to sell our house our family was sleeping on the hospital room floor we never left him alone for the 11 and a half months that he struggled to survive he was three years old and my daughter was a year a year and a half younger at the time so with our two-year-old child uh, we were sleeping on hospital room floors, literally. Wow. When we finally um, had to let Sean go and come to terms with that loss, I wanted nothing more to do with band, nothing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't care less if a trombone player was out of tune. Why would I care? You know, who cares about superior trophies? Who cares about winning a competition? Who cares about fixing staccatos in the back row? And I remember that the, the, the directors in my state, this is about, about the fourth year after this loss, the loss of my son happened in 2003, about four years later, and I was off the grid, I started getting calls to do clinics. Now, nah, you know, listen, I, I'm sorry, I'm just, I, I just can't. And they would tell me, oh, yes, you can and you will. You don't have a choice. We already decided you need to, you need to come back to where you belong. And I'm like, I, th I guess it was survivor's guilt. Hmm. But when I finally did come back, the middle school, they used to feed into the high school where I taught. So it was my old middle school that I started teaching my old high school and then ended up getting a job at my old middle school that I attended. And I got to be honest with you, the last thing on my mind, Kyle, hmm. was having the band sound great or winning competitions or making a superior. My goal was to try and create something where there was never a kid in the building that was lonely. And I think the main reason was, was because it took me back to when my son was born and I knew he had a disability. One of the things I always worried about is, are people going to invite him to play with him? With, with them? Mm -hmm. Is he gonna have friends? Is he going to be lonely? That killed me. So I finally saw the opportunity to make sure that it, it, and I, the counselors 
loved that I would do this. I would go up to them. I say, hey, listen, there's a little boy who's sitting in the hallway. Like during lunchtime, he'd be with a book by himself leaning. In. I said, who, who, who is that? What grade is he in? Um, can, Ian, even if it was an eighth grader, I would say, can, can, can you help me get this student in the band? And I would walk up to the kid and I would say, hey, what's your name? And they would tell me, are you interested in playing an instrument? Well, maybe I thought so, but I was nervous. I, I would always, I would get that answer a lot. And then I would start talking to the kid and say, hey, I'll tell you what, why don't you come by and I'll, I'll help you get started. Then I would get the kid's schedule changed. All of a sudden, this child is in band with and making friends. And then I would go out of my way to tell my, my officers, hey, listen, new student, can you guys... And then I did something else that was kind of crazy, <laughs> but I think outside the box a lot. Um, I decided to get on Craigslist one day and I borrowed my husband's truck and I drove about 30 miles north of my house and I bought a really nice foosball table for the band room. And I brought it back and I did not ask the administration for permission at all. Um, I put it in the band room, then I bought a, a, a mini air hockey table and i bought a mini uh pool table and then i got bean bags and set them around and by this time my daughter was in the band as well as a sixth grader and it it created this club atmosphere and it was awesome because during lunch time the kids would eat their lunch really fast run to the band room hmm. and other kids in the band room practicing waiting for their turn to play foosball so hey it's you know I might as well practice. So there were kids all over the band room practicing and kids on the air hockey table in the beanbag eating lunch. We had a rule, you could eat lunch as long and I drew a, a chalk line. If the rappers cross the great seal, everyone is banned from the band room for the rest of the year. Wow. Nobody ever broke that rule. Let me tell you what happened. The band membership exploded. The counselors were telling me that they had kids begging them to join band. Mm -hmm. My my re-signing up rate, return rate, was astronomical. The only kids that ever quit band were because they had to because of remediation. And then they would show up crying because they had to turn in their instrument. Right. And then I would tell them, those kids, I would tell them, I'll let you be in the after school band, but trial basis one year. After that, you got to, you know, mm -hmm. come back in normally. Um, and Kyle, I will tell you that the transformation was i'm not even going to use the word amazing it was inexplicable because i suddenly i had kids that were practicing to not let each other down they were practicing because they wanted to get better and, and i'm not saying people need a foosball table to want to get better in band that's not the point obviously kids want to get better but it it, it helped the kids that maybe were not so tied to the discipline of practicing mm -hmm. you know and and the issue is kids I don't mean to generalize, but because of technology, we're not dealing with the same uh, um, type of emotional development as we were a while back. Correct. So if we can offer them something to reach more intrinsically, because then again, you know, honestly, Kyle, you can't sign band because they want to learn their A-flat concert scale. Hmm. <laughs> no, they don't. They join band because they want to learn how to play that beautiful, shiny thing that they became visually attached to, and they want to make friends. Mm -hmm. They want to belong to something. I, at, 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 at the end of the day, we all have that gene that we want to belong to something, every single one of us. So the question that I want to go to next is, um, you're right, they want to feel like they're part of a family and they want to be good at what they're doing. Right. That I think that's also a big thing. I think kids, whatever they're doing, they do want to be good at it. And if it's good, that will attract more kids as well. So I just have to go yes, back. To the, I mean, absolutely. I've I've never thought about bringing arcade games and stuff like that into the band room. So I know I'm probably the, not the only band director going, whoa, that's that's very outside the box. So I am very curious. It is. How, it was outside the box. How to be able to be more of that, you know, family and and all of that while not sacrificing um 
you know, the musical intention of what you're going for as well. Okay. And then uh, again, and then to boost recruitment. And again, right now, these things I'm talking about have to do with recruitment and retention. Um, then we'll talk about uh, some more of the musical aspects. So um, one of the other things that I used to do was I would host uh, parties, for example, and especially in the middle school, this works great in the middle school. And it, I didn't do it so much uh, when, when I went back to the high school, but it, recruiting, it, like having parties and hosting parties was an incredibly effective thing. For example, Halloween time, I would do a Halloween decorating party and everybody was invited to bring materials, that, but the rule was no gore. It, could, it couldn't be gory, okay? Skeletons or ghouls or whatever you want, and we would make a creature band in the hallway where other people in the school could see it. And the kids would set up old instruments with, you know, and make stuffed creatures with masks. And it was basically like a ghoul band outside in the hall. And the other kids would stop by. They loved it. And then on Halloween, uh, we would do a, a, a party and I would bring in uh, a DJ or I would let the kids DJ and you know all the music had to be clean and then we had the drinks and we had the strobe light and fog machine and I would stand outside the door and this was the cool thing I, I would make an announcement for the uh, faculty or the assistant principal announcing that there was a Halloween bash in the bannerman for the students to please steer clear of the band wing after school when the bell would ring and all the band kids backpacks were outside in the hall in a straight line and they would throw their backpacks down and run inside and kids that were not in band would walk over because of course they didn't want to stay away from the band wing and they wanted to look inside and i'd be there and instead of saying i'm sorry you can't come in because you're not in band i would say what's your name and they would tell me and i'd say well this this is it's for the band members but if you want to join band i would love to sign you in the band next semester would, would, would you like to play an instrument and then they would say yeah and i already had the list with like you know the name the id number what do you want to play what you know mm -hmm. and then i would hand that to the assistant principals the enrollment went through the roof right it went through the roof just having a party in the fall and a party in the spring that the whole school knew about so those are some kind of techniques. And then one of the other things that I would do, and this is the last thing I'll, I'll talk about before I go into the musical aspects, is I would try to find um, community fundraising, not fundraising, I'm sorry, goodwill events to help them raise awareness on helping others. Yes, the, the, the food drive, but now every year for the holidays, we would have a big box and we would donate toys. Every child was asked to bring a new unwrapped toy. And by the end of it, it was overflowing and we would drop it off at the hospital. We would take photographs and the kids felt great about that. So it was one of those things where I also incorporated life lessons, awareness, talking about other people's feelings, kindness. Those were important things that honestly, Kyle, I will tell you, bonded the band together in a very compassionate and uh, community sense. Now, you asked about the music. What, what did we do uh, to incorporate the concept of emotion, which is the title of the clinic, the Emotionally in Tune Band Director? Well, how many times have we opened up? And again, they, they were all already set up with the emotional talking about kindness to each other and making friends and helping others in the band make friends. See that? And this is my point. That primed them getting them to think more emotionally more humanely mm -hmm. primed them to think more emotionally and humanely when it came to the music creating an, an atmosphere where they were encouraged and taught to be that way to each other so shifting over to the music how many times do we open the conductor's book and there's a whole story about the piece and we don't look at it. We don't read it. Much less we don't read it to the kids. They don't know what, they don't know who they are playing. They don't know what they are playing. They are playing notes. We are talking to them about musicality and expression. But if a, if, if a particular piece of music 
has a spiritual, deeply emotional human aspect that inspired its writing, why not share that with the kids? Mm -hmm. Even a march. When I do a clinic, I'll walk in, I'm conducting a march and I'll stop them and I'll say, do you guys know what marches were meant for? What, 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 what is the purpose oh, to march down the street? No, <laughs> you know, the, well, maybe that's one of the purposes, but, but honestly, march is also, how scary is it to go into battle and defend your country and, and be in some foreign land sticking up for people's rights, fighting people you don't know and risking your life, especially an 18 or 19 year old person. It's terrifying, right? A march is meant to instill pride. When you have pride in something, it gives you courage. When the troops come home and we're playing a march, thanking them for risking their lives, there's more human reasons to share than just quarter note equals 120. Let's play this with a detached style and give it some accent. Yes, that's all wonderful. But if we can take it a step deeper mm -hmm. and help the kids understand the deeply human reason for why any particular piece is written, what is it supposed to represent? They become more emotionally invested. And when I started doing that, and I started doing that like way before any of this stuff happened to my family. I, I still remember, and I don't know what it was that made me say it, but you know, the, the story with Danny Boy, the lyrics. And my symphonic band, they loved playing the march that we were doing and they loved playing the overture, okay? I think the overture that year, it was actually, uh, we were doing a transcription. I think it was Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. I, I don't recall, gorgeous piece, they loved it. But Irish tune from County Derry, that was their favorite. You know when it became their favorite? When I told them the story and what the lyrics of Danny Boy meant. Hmm. That's when it became their favorite. So suddenly these high school kids that love loud, fast music that makes you get down, their favorite piece and they would always go, yes, was when I would say Irish tune. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would turn off the lights. They could barely see their music in front of them just to create that mood of, you know, ex so things that we can do to help the kids connect to the spiritual act aspect. Um, even, even with one note that, that, that you sustain and, and there's a crescendo and then this peak and tell them what is somebody feeling at this point? Somebody tell me. And I would get great answers, anguish, you know, triumph, whatever it was. So then they're connecting human deep emotions to what they're playing. It really helps them tolerate the occasional boredom because it can get boring to sit there and work on one measure until you get it just right. Well, what are we trying to get just right there? Um, I think those aspects are really, really important. And even if a story now, even if a story doesn't have, if a, if a, if a score doesn't have a story on the inside cover, you can make one up. For example, um, Seesaw Trilogy. This is when I was doing the middle school. And it has the first movement, the lyrical movement, and the end movement. Okay. There was no story there except that these are well known seasons. So I was like, okay, the first one, I got a big giant old wooden boat in the old days. And and the sailors are are showing up with their bags and they haven't seen their friends in months and they're gonna be off to, to sail for months and they're super excited and you can hear everybody chattering, hey, what's up? Hey, what's going on? You know, and I would go like that and the kids would laugh. And then I, I would say, then they got their bags and they're throwing them over to their friends to catch and put down. And then they're walking up the, 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 the gangplank, whatever. And that joy, that, that reunion, that excitement. The kids would play it totally differently as soon as I was done with that little speech. All of a sudden, the accents were there. You know, their marcados were there, whatever. It was that, that gusto kind of thing. And then the second movement, 
I would describe, okay, now is their first night at sea. And they haven't seen the full moon over the water in months. And there's a gorgeous full moon and the sea is totally calm. And all the sailors are on the deck. And they're just standing there staring at this gorgeous moon and their reflection. And they're feeling peace. And the kids will say it that way. Literally, I would barely have to talk about anything, you know, connecting and don't chop your phrases. They would do it because they picture the mean water, the serenity, the peace, and they try to emulate it. Mm. And then the last movement is very triumphant again. And I would say, okay, now this is the next morning. The sun is up, everybody's back up on deck, the wind is blowing, they're accelerating, and then there was this big moment in the peace, and I was like, and I want you to picture the, the wind gusting right behind the boat, and the sail just pops open, boom, and it, the boat just takes off. And they played it that way. Now, on, from a technical standpoint, you want to know how many hours I saved on having to talk about articulation and style and feeling just by telling them a bedtime story, you know? Mm -hmm. It was great. Then I could spend more time about you know, on the little technical. Okay, this is not in tune. Let's get this in tune. Okay, fine. They're like, okay, okay, we'll 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 do it because they were feeling the spiritual thing, and it was cute because during some of the big intense moments, like on that one note where the sail pops open, sometimes they would be playing, and when it came to that part, I would catch some of them smiling and looking at each other, you know. So I think if I could give two huge pieces of advice. The first one from the friends, the spiritual standpoint, try to do activities, extra activities. And yes, it does take up more time, okay? Yeah, you might have to spend a Friday afternoon doing hosting a Friday afternoon uh, pizza popcorn movie hang where everybody shows up in sweats and they can bring a pillow because that I used to do that too once a month sweats and a pillow pizza and popcorn and watch a movie together all you know just laying on the floor of the band room with a big giant screen yeah it takes up a little extra time but the reward is going to be huge because you're creating a family atmosphere of support you're creating an atmosphere where kids are able to make friends they're going to want to stay they're going to grow more. They're going to they're going to be willing to take all the little sacrifices that you're asking them to do. They're going to be more willing to learn all 12 scales because they want to be there so badly. Mm -hmm. Because you're tapping into what they want spiritually and just by evolution. The people that were wired to want to be in a group, they survived. The people that were wired to be loners, it's not a bad thing to want to be a loner. That's not what I'm saying. Everybody has their, you know. But sometimes they didn't survive. So just because of genes being passed along, you know, we, we, those of us who are here today, we're more wired to want to be part of something. Mm -hmm. Now, tapping into the musical aspect of it, if, like I said, if we can get them to really connect on a deeply human, human level, they are going to just by default, I think, portray some of the emotional interpretations that we're trying to teach them with words but we can get there faster if we let them connect to the story behind it mm -hmm. the human story yep. if you don't know one make one up you can ask the kids to do that too what do you guys picture on this piece you can play them the recording first if you want if you guys had to write a story or write a movie about this piece what would it be for you you have them write it down you know anyway that's my thought on that <laughs> how how did that transform its way into your jazz rehearsals same thing same thing i would uh with regards to the jazz rehearsals i would either make up a story behind a tune mm -hmm. or I would tell them whatever it was that that the composer would write. I, I always used to read to the kids whatever was on the inside uh, cover. If there was something, sometimes there isn't. Um, and when, again, when I do a jazz clinic, let's say we're doing a ballad. 
I immediately tell them, what is a ballad? Usually, not always, but often, it's a song expressing profound feelings of love for another human. And I'll, I'll tell them, maybe you guys are not at the age, of, well, if it's high school, I don't say that, because by that time, everybody's had a crush. But, um, or I'll, I'll tell them, okay, how many of you have a little brother or sister? A lot of them will raise their hand. Do you remember the first time you held that little baby in your hands? What did you feel? A lot of times you see the kids, they'll, they'll, they'll go like, oh, I say, okay, that. Or sometimes uh, there's this one piece, I forget what the name of it is, but it doesn't, it's not a love song. It, it doesn't have that feeling, but it has a very gentle innocence about it. And I've told the kids before, okay, just imagine you bought this little tiny, tiny eight week old golden retriever puppy. And they're like, oh, they all do that. Now just imagine a cute, sweet little girl in her little flower dress playing in a field of flowers. And this little puppy is just bouncing all around her, fluffy. And now she's holding her puppy. And even the boys, <laughs> you can see them all, oh. <laughs> okay, now play it that way. And all of a sudden, instead of chopping phrases, they're, they're playing with tenderness. Mm -hmm. And if you got something like, you know, a barn burner, <laughs> one of the things that I'll do a lot is, you know, connecting. I don't know that I'm not knocking this, okay? Because I know I know a lot of people do count off and walk off the stage. Or they'll stand off to the side. I honestly think that there is nothing wrong with conduct, and I don't mean conducting like this, your jazz band. But if you got dit, 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 bah, just Ah, you you know you you're there and you're 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 giving the kids your energy on these specific important hits, you know, on on stylistic changes in a piece, just giving them cues that that show them how the music is affecting you because the kids feed off our energy, mm -hmm. and I don't mean feed in a negative way, in a positive way, because there's a negative way to feed off somebody's energy by taking it from them. But if we feed each other energy, it's a beautiful symbiosis. And in all my years of adjudicating festivals, I will tell you that some of the best bands I ever had and that I ever saw were because, or that, that I ever heard were because in part, not just the ability of the kids, obviously, but the director was there with them giving cues in a passionate, dynamic way that energized them. So that energy just kind of oozed off the stage into the audience. Mm -hmm. And it's not showmanship. It's just, I dig this music as much as you do, and I'm going to be up here digging it with you. Let's dig this together. Mm -hmm. And again, Again, I'm not going to criticize anyone that snaps their fingers and walks off stage because maybe they do that during rehearsal. You know, that's fine. But so that's that's one of the ways. And with the rhythm section, I you know I, I love to use analogies too when I do talking about the rhythm section. And it's funny because the kids always laugh on this. I don't like bacon, but I use this analogy. I was like, all right. Rhythm section, you guys, you're the frying pan, okay? And then I look at the at the horns and I was like, y'all, y'all, y'all just strips of bacon, <laughs> raw bacon, and they're like, oh, ugh, you know. And then I'm like, okay, each one of you is a strip of bacon, and you over here, you're the frying pan. And I look at the drummer. If it's a funk chart, it you know on the hi hat. <laughs>